Welcome to Global Information Security Society for the Professional of Pakistan. So, hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, as you can read the title, that today's webinar is about electronic voting and challenges and the move forward. Uh, we have um, uh, we when we when we chose this topic, many people ask you why you guys uh, have chose this topic for a webinar. Uh, so I had the same thing in my mind that great nations are built by great leaders, and many people have different ways to choose uh, who they want uh, them to lead. And if we talk about Pakistan, we have a parliamentary and democratic democratic system in which people vote for the constituents uh, for their constituency candidates and those candidates go on and select like prime minister. And the prime minister gets elected for five years. But sadly, the current system has many flaws. Some are procedural, some, some, are, some are here because uh, there is a lot of lack of implementation in many sort of things. And uh, the people <laughs> would have fake votes. Uh, and, and after every election, the losing side mostly uh, comes out with the allegations of rigging. So uh, recently, there has been an announcement that uh, the next election would be held electronically. So we have chosen this topic so that we can discuss. We can discuss what sort of challenges it poses. Uh, is it feasible? Is it feasible for our uh, country or uh, or would, how, how can we make it more secure? So, uh, uh, First, I would like to introduce our uh, exception, very amazing panel here. We have Rehan Bashir with us. Uh, we have Kashif Nawar, and we have Ahmed Javid. First, I would like to introduce Rehan. Rehan is an information security professional with more than 15 years of experience. He's currently working as a managing consultant with Synopsys, which is lots of stuff, uh, but security design and implementation is one of them. He has helped many organizations, both in public and private sectors, uh, to comply with cybersecurity requirements and creation of cybersecurity policy. Trehan has also acted as an advisor uh, to organizational leaders uh, of cybersecurity programs. He has managed multiple projects, which uh, included um, policy making, procedure development, risk management, and compliance. Along with that, he has also done security audits. Uh, he has also done in those projects network and security assessment, uh, penetration and uh, penetration testing, and application vulnerability assessment. Rehan's area of expertise is like all other uh, panelists, it's pretty long, but I would just name a few. Uh, one of uh, the top uh, that you mentioned was, uh, and uh, we know, is enterprise network and architecture security, application security. Uh, security project management, risk management, audit and compliance, uh, which uh, and NIST and FISMA are top of them, along with ISO. He also has expertise in cloud security and digital forensics. Rehan holds a bachelor's degree in addition uh, to numerous security and risk management certifications, uh, CSSP and CCSP are top of the line, and he has a long list. Rehan uh, also completed a uh, security, cybersecurity and executive strategy program from Stanford University, the prestigious Stanford University. Thank you, Rehan, for joining the panel. Thank you very much for inviting me. And our next panelist is from Fortinet, the Fortinet, Kashif Nawaz. Kashif Nawaz is a subject matter expert. Uh, he's currently focusing and working in OD security for uh, Fortinet. The Fortinet, uh, most of you people know, is the one of the top firewall and network um, security and devices company. Uh, in past, uh, Kashif has worked with Nozomi Network, Tails, IBM, Fujitsu, and Royal Bank of, Royal Bank of uh, Scotland, which is also known as RBS. Uh, Kashif's area of expertise include uh, <coughs> governance risk and compliance. Uh, creation of uh, security-related policies and national laws, uh, which complements the security policies and the uh, security implementation techniques. Uh, he also has a very much very good grip on network security tools 
such as firewalls, uh, proxies, etc. Uh, he also has a very good experience in enterprise enterprise technologies. He enterprise technologies. He's all. Uh, he's also uh, an IoT Internet of Things and OT along with IT. OT is operational technology. Uh, security is, is also expert in that. Kashi Faisal uh, organization is building their security program, design frameworks for um, government uh, and financial institutions. He has helped companies to expand footprint in uh, various markets, such as Middle East, a uh, Middle East uh, that I know of. I, know, I believe there would be others as well. Uh, and uh, he has also worked with government in establishing uh, in, with, in the establishment of information security policies and the laws. Kashif holds a master's degree in addition to new, numerous technical and management certifications. Uh, Kashif was also invited to join SANS uh, advisory board. Uh, we all know SANS is one of the most pre prestigious uh, in information security certification related body. And the list is long of all the panelists, but uh, during the shortest time, I would just say here. Uh, Kashif, thank you very much for joining the panel. Uh, I think you, uh, we're not- uh, Thank you, Mike, yes, thank you. Okay, welcome. Okay, our last expert uh, is Ahmad Dawid. Ahmad Dai has, has also a member of our DSSP community, and all of them are the member of our DSSP community, but he's also an administrator and coordinator of Qatar chapter. He is an IT and information technology global risk and compliance expert uh, and specializing in uh, digital trust, cybersecurity, data privacy, business resilience, and information assurance. With over 17 years of professional experience, Ahmed had a, has a wide array of industry experience, including government, finance, banking, oil and gas, uh, technology services. He has also been part of two big four funds, ENY in past and Deloitte Middle East. Currently, he's working for uh, a Qatar-based firm as an executive director. Uh, uh, <clears throat> he's, uh, along with uh, his uh, job, he's also a member of ISACA, BCI, PMI, and PSC, and holds uh, senior level positions in multiple, uh, multiple community organizations and working for social impact. Ahmed Bhai, welcome to the panel. And I would, lastly, I would like to introduce myself. I uh, don't have a deep resume, just like other panelists, but I work for a, uh, a top, uh, one of the top, sorry, it is the top telecom uh, company in Pakistan. And I look after the cybersecurity operations related issues and activities. And I also coordinate the Islam, DSC Islam. So that's with the introduction. Sorry, I took lots of time, but uh, the panelists were uh, so interesting and uh, the resumes were so deep so that I had to take time. So, so first I would like to uh, say that, uh, as I have mentioned, the importance of uh, this, uh, the stake and importance of this election. Uh, first, I would like to ask, like, what's the importance of free and fair elections? Ahmed Bhai, can you please shed some light on that? What's the importance of free and fair elections? Okay, uh, okay. I think I think we have to unmute. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Now you can unmute. Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. First of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me on this um, panel, and I'm uh, sharing uh, my panel with my very dear friend of mine, Mr. Kashif, as well as the Rehan Sab. It's a privilege once again and um, um, just to start with I mean, from a topic perspective and the very first thing which come, come, comes to our mind is that you know the electoral process for any nation per se is like uh, considering from a sensitivity point of view and the, the how critical it is for any nation is that which is a process which basically concludes and decides the future of any nation. Uh, first of all, man, uh, my apologies, Wes, man, I was not been able to hear you very well because voice was like, man, there's a bit of distortion in your voice. So if I correctly got your question is like, you're asking about that, what exactly I, I uh, consider as an electronic voting, right? 
Uh, no, sorry. The, 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 the thing was that uh, I was asking that, could you please shed some light on why, uh, the, the, what's the importance of pre and fair elections, the importance of it? That's exactly the point. Um, thank you very much for, again, highlighting and correcting my understanding from the question point of view. See, the, the, any election electoral process for any nation is such a critical process, which basically helps them deciding their future. That helps them selecting the leaders who will be basically leading their um, nation, you know, nation level initiatives and whatever strategic initiatives they need to drive, whether it's from an academic perspective or education sector, economy or, or what, what not. That's why it's like, you know, for any nation, considering from its, any historical background, if we see, if we take ourselves from the, 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 the back in like in you know, the 50s, there used to be um, a more, you know, very less reliance on the technology. At that time, most of the things were be taken in the manual, as a manual practice. If we consider, uh, um, you know, the, the, the trend these days, still there's a concept of like, you know, having the polling stations where voters are being invited and, you know, they are, they are extending their votes in terms of like, you know, um, giving their opinion, what is the right leader, or what is the right minister or whoever uh, they want to, to vote for. But because of the, the technological evolution, the way um, this electoral process happens have been transformed completely as well. There's more reliance on the technology than on a manual processes. Now, if we take uh, from that perspective, that means the, the free and fair election, that is the need of the process to have this thing done with an extreme transparency, with the proper check and balance, so that we can you know, produce our, our reliable results which this basically decides a positive or, or the leadership which comes really on merit. I'm sorry, uh, I think I have a bit of a problem with the audio here, if I can, like just, just give me a minute. Right. Can you hear me now? No, guys, I'm not able to hear you. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Ahmed, uh, we hear you. We hear you. I think uh, there is some noise issue with uh, Aves mic. So, uh, Aves, can you check it again? Is it better? Right? Is it better? better you, you, yes. You have, yes. You have to hear your mouth. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. We can hear you, Aves. Why? We can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, gee, uh, I'm sorry, I'm on my eyelids, uh, okay. Uh, no worries, so what I was trying to say is like, let me just, um, um, you know, um, the last sentence which I was saying is that the, the fair and free election is the need of the nation of, of the, for, I mean, from the start and forever, it was a need. And we need to have this thing in a very, in, um, done in an extreme transparency with a proper check and balance so that we can select the leadership based on the merit. Okay, thank you, Amantai. Thank you very much for shedding some light on importance of free and fair elections. So, uh, so, so the topic is electronic voting. I would like just like to clarify here that we would be discussing the challenges and uh, we would basically discussing the electronic voting and the challenges uh, in the cybersecurity realm. Uh, and uh, one thing that I would like to uh, clarify here, that all of the panelists, they, uh, they are representing their own self. Uh, whatever they're saying, it does not represent uh, whichever company they work in or they're associated with. Uh, so uh, going on, uh, I would like to say that uh, I, I have been searching about electronic voting and it has been implemented, successfully implemented in more than um, partially or completely in 18 countries. Some countries have implemented it thoroughly and some some countries have still have doubts. Uh, and there are two types of electronic voting. One is computer-based, uh, uh, computer-counted-based, <coughs> and the other is uh, digital DRE. They call it DRE, let, uh, which, in which the whole process is recorded digitally from the ballot, process, uh, from the ballot paper issuance to its counting, 
to its audit. Everything is digital. Uh, so, 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 so going on, I would like to ask that that these are uh, something which are related to the technology of or of digital voting or the e-voting. So there are two factors or two challenges posed by that. One is that uh, when you have to implement electronic voting, you have to keep the identity of the person anonymous. And second thing is that you have to in, uh, enable an environment in, in where the people would be able to trust the system. So I would like to ask Rehanbe here is that how critical those factors are when we, uh, when we take anonymity and trusting on the platform uh, into the account. Okay, I think uh, if I have to unmute every time. Uh... Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Wes. No, I agree with what uh, Ahmed uh, said, uh, but before we go into that, uh, what requires an electronic voting and the, the two points that you have put together. So free and fair elections, I want to go into it a little bit uh, more before we dive into, into e-voting and or i-voting or however you want to put it together. So a free election, uh, so there are free and fair elections. There are two things in there, free and fair. So a free election uh, is a one in which all citizens are able to vote for their, you know, candidates of their choice. So that is free election. So, you know, if I want to do vote for somebody, I can freely choose that candidate and vote for that person. Second aspect of it is fair election. So fair election is the one in which all votes have equal power and uh, counted accurately. So that is very important. That votes should be counted accurately. Now, for free and for the elections to be free and the elections to be fair, there are three, uh, you know, standards that it should meet. First standard is before voting. Second one is during the voting. And the third one is after the voting. Now, when you implement the systems, whether it's e-voting, i-voting, or even ballot process or ballot system, you have to consider these three standards and make sure the whole process is aligned three standards. So for example, I'm giving you an example. Before voting, uh, the things that we need to con consider before voting is that citizens are able to register to vote. Voters have uh, access to reliable information. I mean, that comes to free journalism and all that. And uh, any citizen can run for the office. No intimidation from government. Uh, on that citizen. So these are the three aspects of before voting. Second standard is voting. So when actually a person is going to uh, the ballot and casting their vote. Now in that area, uh, you know, the voters uh, have access to uh, polling places, you know, they can go freely to a polling place and cast their vote and whether they are doing it via paper ballot or they're doing it via EVM, electronic voting machine. Right, so, so that's the process that comes under voting. And people should be voting without any intimidation. Whether you talked about uh, arrest that, uh, you know, how you manage where voters are going and, you know, casting their vote, are they being intimidated? Are they forced to vote for a certain candidate? Or are they free to vote for anybody without any intimidation? And then voting is free from fraud. What it means is that ballots are counted properly if they're paper ballots. And if you're using EVM machines, there should be no uh, impact on the EVM machine. There is no outsider that can have access to the EVM machine so that that person can change the results of the, uh, of the votes that are uh, you know, casted to EVM. And the last one is after voting. And the after voting part is also very crucial as part of the free and fair election. That is, ballots are counted accurately and correctly, and results of uh, elections are respected. So now, and both of these things can be achieved if you know the citizens of that country believe in the in the electoral process that has been put in place. Now, the electoral process. Uh, the next step is how are you conducting that electoral uh, electoral process, and that would be as happening in Pakistan right now with paper ballots. 
India, they are very much into uh, EVMs. They are using EVM, but they have their own challenges. Other countries like Estonia, uh, they have implemented i-voting, not e-voting. Yeah, not e-voting. There is a yeah, difference, a difference. and e-voting. Yes. Yeah, we have yes. to clarify. There's, yeah, we will clarify that. that as well. Yeah, so we will clarify that. So, uh, but again, Estonia is running uh, i-voting with the full backup of paper balloting. They are not just running i-voting or e-voting. They have to have a paper ballot. And in a case of dispute, paper ballots will take precedence and not the uh, I-vote or E-vote that they're casting over there. So, uh, so, so, that's, so I just want to put uh, forward what the process, what the free elections, what, what is free in free and fair elections and what is fair in fair, free and fair elections and what are the standards that, that uh, you know, government should follow when conducting these uh, elections in terms of voting. So now we can talk about the next step, how technology can help uh, in, these, in this process of conducting a free and fair election and adhering to these three standards, which is before voting, voting, and after voting. So I think I should stop and uh, we can uh, talk to technology later on and okay. uh, give Kashif. Okay. okay, so we have... Uh... So before going to Kashirbhai, I would like to say that there are two countries which are completely digital when it comes to electronic voting. India, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it goes with mix and match of um, uh, analog and digital technology. It has an analog system which gets printed on the EVM machines, analog, analog prints, or you can say a physical prints uh, are used and then patched on the EVMs and then they are uh, sent to the uh, many constitu constituencies. And in Brazil, it's, 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 it is uh, completely digital, but again, it is decentralized. It is only used to count the votes and keep the audit trail of the system. Uh, none, of, none of these two uh, big, uh, big population countries have, have a centralized electronic voting machine system. So I just wanted to put it here. Uh, so, so I would like to go to Kashir Bhai here is that do you think, uh, or do you think that the EVM should, uh, or electronic, uh, electronic voting process should completely replace the uh, physical uh, uh, voting system or it should, uh, it should, vote should be run in parallel? Uh, absolutely not, uh, for now anyway, or for the foreseeable future. You need to have uh, paper uh, ballots as a backup for audit purposes and for many other reasons. And I think we need to clarify exactly what we're talking about when we talk about e-voting. So. Uh, Rehan's introduction of before, during, after voting was excellent. And from a technology point of view, I see actually four different types of technology in this whole question. Uh, one is the, what we would traditionally call in IT, identity, identity and access management systems, right? So how do voters prove who they are, right? Uh, and all of the infrastructure that goes behind that. So an ID card, is, is Nadra's database safe? I mean, we've heard news recently that it possibly wasn't safe, right? I'm not saying it isn't, but maybe, yeah. all right? So th there's questions about identity management, firstly. Secondly, right, uh, 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 the registration of that as an eligible voter. So is this person eligible to vote? Then the question is, with his authenticated, verified ID, he's eligible to vote which district or county or local area or suba is he allowed to vote in, right? And can he duplicate that vote in other districts? So there's the identity and access management kind of uh, aspect of it from a technology point of view. Then there's consolidation of the voter poll books, what is known as voter poll books across multiple districts across the whole country to make sure that that ID hasn't been used anywhere else in the country, which requires some sort of consolidation or synchronization, right? which then brings me to the next point, which is the tallying and reporting of votes, right? Tabulating those results by precinct or council or district or whatever system you have in a particular country. Then there's the backend management all, all of that in terms of networks and infrastructure connecting all of these systems. Uh, and then the fourth point and, and the one that we probably will focus on most and I will discuss is, is the actual voting itself. Do you vote with a piece of paper, punch a hole in it and then put it in the machine which will register it? Or do you tick a box and you have optical scanning of that tick on the box? Uh, there's online voting. Do you go for online voting? Uh, there's many different ways that the vote, so uh, point number four, which is the voting itself, how that voting can be done. And each one of these four things, so the voter registration, identity access management, 
the tallying, reporting and consolidation of those identities and, and then the tabulation and the enumeration of those votes and, and making sure that the integrity of that, the, and then the vote itself, how the vote itself is cast or given, these are four different systems, four different types of technology and the infrastructure to connect them all, right? These are diff different uh, technology use cases, excuse me. So um, we need to address each one of these technology aspects in a, in a separate way in some respects, because of course they have one governing standard. Uh, NIST has some guidance on it. The European Council has, Council of Europe has some guidance on it. And I've pasted the links in the chat for that. But uh, essentially each one of these four things and then the subdivision of the voting aspect itself needs to be discussed. Do we, do, do we allow online voting? I would say no, right? Not yet anyway, uh, over the internet, but it depends on the use case again, because if you are a shadow government in a country that's been occupied by a foreign power, then maybe the only way is to have online voting. So it depends on use case, right? But right now in Pakistan, I fail to see how e-voting uh, of any kind will, will uh, solve the problems that we've seen in the last two weeks because the problems in the last two weeks are not related to the fact that there was fraud in the votes cast or miscounts in the votes cast. It was more related to uh, a question mark of the intentions and, and the incentives given to people casting votes. And here we're talking about uh, parliamentary votes for Senate seats, not for general elections. General right? elections yeah. So again, there's also a question of the scope of e-voting. Are you talking about general elections? Are you talking about voting within a company, a particular parliamentary subcommittee, the parliament or the Senate? There's many aspects to this, right? So um, uh, sorry to open like a Swiss cheese question in terms of uh, lots of holes need to be addressed, but right. fundamentally, I think there's two, two things. One is that uh, like we do in IT and OT security, you start off with a risk question, you know, impact and likelihood. Right. So the likelihood you may consider low. I don't consider it low, by the way, but you may consider the, the atta an attack on a country's general election voting systems uh, uh, as low. And we've seen in the case of the US elections in Russia, it's not low. Right. Uh, but the impact, <clears throat> the impact uh, of even a, forget forget uh, a real attack, even the suspicion of an attack on a general election is enough to to make the public lose confidence in that election. So even if there's a suspicion and it's not proven, the suspicion as we've seen is enough to potentially uh, undermine the whole democratic process. As we saw in America, there was only a suspicion. There wasn't much evidence, but there was a significant number of people in the US who were US citizens, US voters, who lost confidence in, in, in those systems and therefore tried to uh, do what they did on Capitol Hill uh, in, uh, was it November or December or January? I can't yeah. remember now. January, uh, so, yeah. January. So, so, so the point is that the risk is too high right now to rely solely on these systems. And that's why you need to have manual accounts available, manual audits available of physical paper ballots, right? Leaving, uh, and, and leaving aside Pakistan, that was my statement. Regarding Pakistan, it doesn't solve the problems we've seen in the last two weeks. And also, we, I don't think we have a mature enough uh, uh, society in terms of everyone is electronically registered. Not everybody is, that's a fact, right? Uh, and everybody will uh, understand what to do in an electronic EVM, uh, EVM machine, right? They may not understand what to do. Uh, and they could eat, when they're being guided as to what to do, they may be easily misguided. So I think there's lots of uh, maturity questions here as well. So I would like to compliment uh, to whatever Kashif Bhai has said in the last, that uh, the current process of balloting or the election is pretty complex. Even a simple person of a layman or person who is not you know, educated, he has to rely on uh, guidance of the presiding officer on how to cast a vote. So, uh, so, so, so with EVM machines, I believe that's, that's again my statement or uh, not uh, uh, that we can simplify the process uh, so that the people who are not able to use or you can say uh, who needed help in order to cast a vote they could cost uh, and they could do it themselves uh, and it would you can uh, and i believe and that evm machines evm machines also uh, further democratize uh, the whole system why because you know they are differently able people some who cannot hear some who cannot see so the evm machines and they we, we we can build an interface 
in a way that it would help those people in choosing and electing those leaders as well. So I would like to, uh, so, uh, and again, uh, when I was saying uh, that when we, uh, I was talking about replacing EVMs, I did not mean that completely uh, replace uh, the audit trail with the electronic process as well, just like we see in Brazil the, and India, that whenever you select, uh, whenever you cast a vote, there is a paper trail, it gets established with respect to time. It keeps the uh, identity of the voter anonymous, but they, uh, they have some sort of audit mechanism in place. Uh, so, okay, so uh, enough from my side. Uh, I would like to go to Ahmed Bhai, and how do you see that uh, should we uh, opt for it? And would, would it solve the current problems that we have with manual process? Because every time you see that the losing side, it comes that, oh, there's a rigging in place. And they cannot, in some cases, the, um, the polling uh, offices, they get run over by powerful uh, people and they even they destroy the ballot papers. And sometimes they are fake bogus votes. Uh, and do you think that we would be able to address this problem with EVM? See, primarily, I think when uh, Kashif Sab has uh, highlighted a very important aspects of the, the, the technological uh, inclusion within the whole process, as Rehan Sab explained, that when we have like, you know, the whole process divided into the three layers. One is the pre part, one is, and, du and then during the voting part and then the post part. Now the technological, you know, that maybe we can embed the technology in each and every stage, but Indeed, the technology will help us simplify the process, bringing more security controls, ensuring the integrity of the information which, in it, which is in it. However, more important aspect here is that end of the day is a people part. And now, for example, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. When Kashif Saab highlighted that, you know, the, the, uh, the polling part and the, the technology they used to come and cast the vote, but how, were, how about, you know, the first voter registration process, the identity and access management, the whole thing which he has highlighted from a technology perspective that has to be backed up strongly with the strong and, you know, the very uh, transparent process of voter registration. And then we have to ensure the integrity of the source of the, the, the voters database. In our case, when if we take an example of of uh, Pakistan electoral process, we have to rely on the databases of NADRA or any other human authority. So in this whole process where people have to take a more important, um, important role in each and every stage of, uh, you know, the keeping the transparency and effectiveness of the process, I, I must say that when the regulators and the legislators have to play a very important role here to bring up, um, you know, a proper check and balance and, you know, we reach to the level that where we can keep the balance that what technology needs to be used in what stage, not from a security perspective, from an ease of use perspective as well. As you rightly said, like, you know, in, in what about those uh, voters who are like special need voters, maybe they are blind, maybe they are, uh, you know, they don't have a hearing ability or they can't use the cast machine or digital device to cast the vote. How about that? So we have to consider all the aspect when it comes to the selection of the technology. But when we, use, we select any technology, let's, for the sake of our discussion, it is EVM. Electronic voting machine can be, can be your mobile phone or smartphone can be used as an EVM if there is a proper application has been developed and deployed by and certified by the, the, the uh, election board. On the other side, when there are cast machines that are available, and, you know, when we can use the electronic voting, which is completely on the web-based voting. However, when, in, when we consider the EVM in the context of, you know, the manual voting with the paper-based balloting or the, the electronic one, see, paper-based balloting is required, in, in my opinion, to have a, a, a physical trail to audit the electoral process post to the election. Because the post to the election, the most important control we have is the, the, the post or election audit, where we need to ensure the, the legitimacy, authenticity, and effectiveness of the whole electoral, electoral process, in which this whole process, 
the technology has to play an important role, but it has to be used in a very intelligent and, and a secure way. For example, I mean, if we use our smartphones to cast the vote, I mean, and the, 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 there is a medium in you know, the internet in the middle and a lot of like security concerns are there. We have to have a complete infrastructure in each and every level, we have to apply the security controls and ensure the, 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 the data integrity within the whole system. If we can't achieve that with that such a mass population, it will eventually have the consequences or exceptions such as we have seen in, the, in the, the, the recent elections in the Senate, that you know it was not a, a problem of a process or a technology. Eventually it has to take, will take us back to the intentions and the motives of the people as well. Electoral process is, is the one of the most critical process for any nation which decides its, its future the leadership for its future. So that is why if the people are not actually are loyal or sincere to have a transparent elections, whatever technology or security measures will bring, it will jeopardize the whole So end of the day, it's all about people. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, uh, so I was, uh, when this whole, uh, uh, electronic process, the change in electronic voting process was announced by the current Prime Minister of Pakistan. I, I read an article from a very, uh, an editor of a very good uh, publishing firm. And that, uh, that journalist uh, did the very basic mistake that everyone does. They confuse the electronic voting system with internet-based in electronic system. So uh, I would like to go to Rehan Bhai again here is that how would you differentiate both and how would you uh, think that we, we are not there for internet uh, uh, based voting yet and there, there has been no plans in, 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 with respect to Pakistan, but how would you uh, explain it to the, a, a person that how different they are and what sort of challenges like they have each, each, each kind of voting process have? Sure. Yeah, then before I start, I, uh, I just want to sum up a little bit uh, for the discussion that Kashif Saab has said and what Ahmed Saab has said is that this whole process needs to be understood from the three, three things, people, process, and technology. So Ahmed Saab pointed it very well that, you know, we have people which are the citizens of the country, the process, which is the electoral process, how it is put together, and the technology and we are talking about EVM and IVMs over here. So all of that has to work together very well to have a very successful electronic voting system or internet uh, connected voting system. Now, the question that you have asked about EVM and IVM. So EVMs are electronic voting machines. Uh, these are the devices that are situated at a polling station and they are not connected to the internet. Uh, you know, uh, uh, a voter goes in, instead of casting a paper ballot into the ballot box, uh, a voter actually go to an electronic machine, which is a kiosk type system, which is a very closed loop system. Uh, you go there, you select your candidate, you push some buttons, uh, you know, and you cast your vote. And the vote stores in the machine while it is there. The advantage of EVM is speed. And that's why India, which is such a big democracy, there's tons of pop huge population over there. It makes the job easier to count the vote because vote is count electronically. And we all know counting vote manually using papers takes much long time than you know, just go to a machine and run a process, run a script or whatever and count the votes. So EVM is disconnected. It's a closed loop system. It's a standalone system. It is not connected to the internet as it should not be connected to the internet. Uh, and then the results uh, can be transferred manually from the EVM device to a central uh, server where all the votes are getting tallied and accounted. So now that process of transferring uh, the votes from EVM to a central server in a, in in itself has issues. I mean, you know, people can uh, connect uh, infected USB to the EVM. Uh, people can manipulate data in the EVM. Uh, you know, a Trojan horse type of 
uh, you know, malicious code can get inserted into the EVM to change uh, the votes that are cast using the EVM. So there are uh, risks that are there. Uh, IVM, on, on contrary to EVM, is not a standalone closed loop system. However, it is a system of voting that is connected to the internet and which allows the citizens to use either their computer <clears throat> or their mobile phones to cast their votes uh, wherever they are. So again, going back to the example of Estonia and India, India is more uh, EVM focused electronic process, while Estonia is more on IVM uh, focused uh, process that they follow. It's a small country. So what they do is uh, they started out with, uh, with the computer laptop where you have to plug in a device card reader. Uh, users take their card just like we have Nadra card. It has chip and encryption on it and a specific pin on it. So if you want to cast your vote, you plug your uh, you know, ID card in and you, know, you cast the vote. They took it on the next level and now they are using mobile phones to make it much more easier for their population, for their citizens to cast the vote by just you know, using their phone uh, you know, and all the technology is stored in the phone using that uh, IBM application and uh, you know, they can cast the vote. Uh, so, so that's the basic difference. But again, uh, uh, there was a proof of concept uh, that was done by Estonian uh, researchers where they were able to circumvent uh, the security of not, from, not only from the client side where users are casting their vote, but also on the server side where the actual electronic counting system was hosted. And uh, there are you know, quite a bit of concerns there. There could be a supply chain attack that can happen on the server. Somebody can inject a malicious code in a server that can then you know, replicate it through a configuration management process to other servers and which you know, may change the results of the election by casting vote in, term, in favor of a specific candidate. So there are uh, you know, technological issues, but again, there are trust issues and process issues over here. So it has to be a very tightly controlled process, uh, whether it would be EVM or IVM. Uh, does that uh, does that answer the question? Uh, the difference? Yeah, between? yeah, it would it would uh, clearly uh, clear the all the doubts or all the confusion uh, everyone or uh, the specific journalist had regarding the electronic voting process and how yes. how the vote differentiate. So okay, right. I would like to go Kashi by here is that uh, as uh, Rehan Bhai has mentioned that we have certain type of attacks that that can happen like USB and uh, he can, someone can put a USB and uh, transfer the code someone can put a Trojan horse uh, or uh, man in the middle attacks are a possibility as well. So we will come to the transmission side later. We would just focus on the kiosk and the reprogrammability of the kiosk. So can't we do, uh, can't we implement some sort of uh, non-programmable chips? Can we, uh, can, uh, and uh, where, uh, when, when get our design or code uh, wet from open source community? Can't we explore that sort of side? Can, can't we do that? And, and so you're talking about the security. Think? You're talking about the security of air gap systems, right? Systems that which are not connected. Yes, security by of the air gap systems. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, right. So I actually have a paper called "The Myth of the Air Gap," but uh, I won't read it all. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, uh, there's a number of issues. One is like uh, Rehan by mentioned, supply chain attacks. Right. Um, uh, unless we are manufacturing our own chips and our own hardware, and everything is natively done within the nation, yeah. uh, you're at risk of a supply chain attack. Uh, uh, from external uh, nations. The, however, the biggest problem I see actually is that in countries like in Europe or, or in the West or developed nations, their biggest concerns are external players like Russia or whoever attacking us. Our biggest concerns are not external players only, it's also internal players, right? In terms of people wanting to corrupt the electoral process. So we have issues where even if everything is manufactured natively within Pakistan, people within the manufacturing companies that are producing the chips or the hardware, they, employees within those companies can be bribed, uh, unfortunately, very easy uh, uh, by internal, not external, but by other internal political factions, for example. So just like in, in the old days, you could just simply put an envelope in someone's pocket and say, vote this way. Uh, now you could do the same for an employee or someone who's a programmer in that particular or chip designer in that particular company to do the same. So the problem goes back to the root issue, which is that uh, unless as a nation we are, we have a, um, 
a very limited attack surface in terms of morality, if you want to put it that way, uh, we're always going to be vulnerable. Uh, I would say, however, that that there is uh, the Indian case uh, and the Australian case and the Estonian, because somebody's mentioned Estonia as well. There's been studies done on Estonia uh, and Australia, which have uh, really exposed a lot, a lot of flaws in uh, Estonia's voting system and Australia's as well. All right? Estonia is a good use case uh, it's, or study case in terms of digitization, digital transformation and e-government, because they are one of the world's leading countries in that respect. Uh, and they have shown that it's, it's, it's not, there's a lot of issues. And there's a reason why, that's the reason why countries like Ireland, Germany, the UK, and a few other European countries, Netherlands, I believe as well, have actually banned uh, uh, e-voting, right? It's banned because they did the study and they didn't allow it. So I know we want to be modern. We want to catch up with the modern world and look at other countries and look at maybe even India and say, look, they're doing it. Why can't we do it? But there's also lots of modern countries for very good reasons that have banned it. And there's actually a piece of legislation in the US right now that was tabled in 2018 or 19, which is also uh, looking at banning relying purely on electronic means to count and register votes as well. So there is some serious concerns. And the reason behind these concerns uh, is not simply the study in Australia and Estonia only, but also that in a, in a physical paper voting system, you can corrupt, uh, you can, uh, leaving aside morally corrupt uh, election officials or politicians or whatever, but you can corrupt maybe a few votes in a few polling stations, but it's very, very difficult to change the result of a nation of 220 million, right? Unless you are organized in a massive, massive conspiracy, which will usually always be exposed because somebody will talk. You need thousands of people to conspire together to change the election results, right? And somebody will always talk. Whereas with one denial of service attack, you can corrupt the whole election potentially as well. So the risk again is much higher when you shift from uh, uh, traditional voting to e-voting. And then the question is what problem are you actually trying to solve? Because unless you identify the problem you're trying to solve. If it isn't broken, don't try to fix it. That's my philosophy. Okay, but but I would like to go back on uh, this one is that sure. uh, the problem with what Pakistan faces is that after every election, uh, there is uh, this uh, there's rhetoric uh, that's built. Yes, there is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. There's rigging. There's rigging, and yeah. there's no there's no way to verify that chain. Uh, so that if the, the one one that uh, the number of votes uh, they are not counted properly that's one yeah. and the second yeah. is that uh, they cannot verify if the votes are genuine or no because there was a time when a person uh, yeah. when a candidate got three uh, more than three hundred thousand vo uh, votes in yeah. a very really large small amount of time so yeah. we have we have a different sort of problems here so 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 do you think Correct. would we be yeah. able to uh, solve those problems with EVM? No. Like just, no. Okay. No. Okay. No. So, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please. Yeah. The the reason why is because uh, if you can stuff ballot boxes uh, by taking control of a whole polling station by guns or by a gang or whatever, right? You can quite easily also do the same uh, by creating uh, in the local taking over a local Nadra office, uh, creating lots of fake identities and and having those fake identities voting as well. And you could probably it's probably easier to do that if you can hack into that local another office and do that in that way or bribe a few officials. So oh, it's the, yeah. the problem is always going to be there if, if you have a if you don't have a good law and order situation. So this is a, a police and law and order situation more than a technology versus manual process situation in my opinion. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I would like to go uh, to Ahmantai is that the cost of um, and the cost is also involved with this sort of stuff. Like like if you have to topple the result, uh, it's, it's difficult if you use paper uh, ballots, but again, if you put in some sort of verification in place, it would be more expensive to, uh, to swing the election in other way. Like you have to verify, you have to uh, create like, let's suppose 100,000 or 200,000 fake fingerprints, and you have to go there and use those fingerprints, which would be more difficult uh, than, you know, take some ballot boxes, mark them and put it in the ballot box. So how do you see that? Would we, specifically to that, that would we be able to, or do we have a chance to correct that problem? Like, uh, like that I have mentioned. Okay, sorry. I, I don't know why it asks you to unmute every time. Yeah, yeah thank you. So, see, I mean, um, as I said earlier, I mean, I'm in opinion to, to go for a hybrid model. The reason being that, I mean, 
there's no perfect model to have uh, um, you know the elections done of a more than 200 million um, population nation whether it's completely electronic technology have its own greater risks as Kashi Sahib said that may, there is a more higher risk to to you know um, to make the whole process electronic because if one major comp the main server or main system is compromised the whole process is compromised even if it comes to the algorithm of the EVM or the, the, the who actually works behind that that the you know the control program for any EVM if there is a malware which can be injected by the manufacturer itself then the whole process is compromised that's why I, again, my point is, uh, I would like to emphasize on the same thing is that there, we cannot basically negate the importance of the, the paper-based balloting as well, even if we use a technology or EVMs, because that will act as a manual trail, which will help us, you know, having the effective audit as a post trail review, uh, you know, uh, after the, the electoral process. That's one thing. Second thing is, um, I should not highlight not only the, most of the, the security aspects or the integrity of the information per se, but uh, I would like to highlight the, the, the ease of use uh, aspect as well and the, the time factor. Because EVM help, uh, helps us counting the, the votes faster. It helps us reducing the time and the manual effort. And it helps us, you know, producing um, and accurate results up to some extent. However, that risk will always be there because if EVMs are not connected to the internet, we can basically hijack the whole polling stations. We can replace the pre-programmed EVM machines with the legitimate one to produce or impact the, 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 the overall, uh, you know, the voting results. However, the impact would be not as greater as having a centralized system which get compromised for the whole of the total process. So my point is again that the process has to be hybrid. The technology usage or the, the right uh, technology usage uh, in form of an EVM uh, has to be based on each and every use case scenario. And accordingly, the check and balance and process controls needs to be uh, practiced. But we cannot overcome the challenge of the human part, which is the intention. If the nation, the corruption is at the nation level, we cannot avoid that because if the people who are actually participating in that process, they have to, to, to reach to the level of that confidence to use that process with the sin extreme sincerity, with the mindset that they are choosing their leaders who will basically bring the brighter future for them. That's not my suggestion. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so I'm getting some sort of mixed opinion here. Some, some, some are getting like, we should not go here. We should not go so there. I mean, my, my response yeah. is the same in, 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 in addition to the Kashi Sahib. Kashi Sahib is saying like, you know, the completely manual, I'm saying hybrid. Yeah. Okay. So he's going for hybrid. Kashi Sahib, yes. the five will correct. I'm not arguing for completely manual. I'm saying we have to have a completely manual backup to audit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. I, I, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. yeah. I would like to uh, go on to Rehan by here, and it says that that as Kashi Bhai said, we have to have a manual uh, or a manual uh, you can system in place, or you can say uh, non digital based audit trail here, so that we can uh, establish uh, that. If the votes are casted, they were uh, not fake votes. They were real votes ca uh, casted by the uh, people. So I would like to say that, can we at least take the verification of the voters pass uh, digitally? Because right now what happens is that a person comes in, a presiding officer, he checks the card, and then he lets the person go into the, uh, go into the, uh, the ballot, uh, you can say, the, uh, to the ballot box and he uh, cast the vote. Can we at least uh, have that sort of verification process in place that when a person gets verified, then he is allowed to go and cast the vote? And uh, there, it, can, can we uh, implement some sort of mechanism uh, so that there's less and less bogus votes? 
Yeah, so, uh, so it's a very interesting topic. I mean, you know, again, going back to people, process, and technology, look at these three buckets, right? Unfortunately, our biggest problem lies in the people area or people bucket when it comes to electronic voting or voting in general, but rather it's electronic or paper ballots because people are the weakest part due to whatever the reason that we are facing in the country. I mean, not only in, in our country, but other countries as well. And we have seen recently in US and, uh, and other uh, countries. So uh, one of the possible use of technology, arguably the possible use of technology that still would not address the people aspect of it, but it will help on large uh, the process and technology of electronic voting system. And that is the use of blockchain. So, uh, so I mean, we are all familiar with, with cryptocurrency. We all use, we are familiar with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And what it is, is, is basically a public ledger and it's a distributed system where it is very difficult to manipulate the system by a single person. You know, in, in a general uh, technology perspective that we are talking about IVMs, you know, a, a, a change in a server can happen, a change in the EVM can happen uh, for whatever reason. But I think blockchain technology can provide that integrity to the process uh, using uh, blockchain technology. So I think I would argue that, that uh, with the hybrid approach uh, using the latest technology that is available at our hand, incorporate that technology and uh, develop the uh, you know, electronic voting system. So that will probably in, uh, you know, increase, not 100% eliminate the risks, but increase the probability uh, where you can trust the process and you can trust uh, the technology. Again, I'm not trusting the people aspect of it. So that's something that we need to consider. Okay. Uh, one, one more thing I want to add is, uh, again, uh, the level of, of maturity of the people process, like in Estonia, uh, a person can cast a mo vote multiple times. So, uh, so the reason uh, they did it is, the logic behind is that, so for example, I'm sitting on my desk, I have my phone in my hand and I am doing electronic voting. I'm, I see, okay, I have candidates. I'm gonna select a candidate. I'm gonna vote that candidate. Now at the same time, my boss is standing next to me or somebody at my home is enforcing me, intimidating me to cast a vote to somebody that they want to vote. So I can do that. But later on, once that threat is over, once that intimidation is over, I can change the code, uh, my vote to the vote that I want to actually cast. And in Estonian uh, system, what they do is they will only count the last word that was uh, casted by that person. So this is, these are the kind of checks and balances that they have put in place uh, uh, in their electronic system. But again, you know, threats are there, risks are there. Uh, some of that, them can be addressed. And from technology perspective, yes, I believe that the blockchain can definitely help improve the uh, electronic voting system. When you're talking about, sorry, yeah, yeah, can I just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. when you're talking about blockchain, there's, that opens up a whole bunch of other questions, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. do you have a public blockchain so the public can view it and verify it as well? Or yeah. do you have a private blockchain, which is just on the, belongs to the election commission, for example, right? That's one question. Then is, yeah. then related to that is who owns the nodes? So if the public are voting with their nodes, who owns the nodes? The election commission, yeah. or is it public? And yeah. then the, question, the next question is, where does the software come from? Yeah. Uh, and the most important one is, yeah. what yeah. is the consensus algorithm? Because the yes. blockchain al algorithms, right? Uh, yeah. The consensus, consensus algorithm and the fact that blockchain spreads uh, your vote across the whole network, right? Across the whole blockchain. Yes, network. nodes, yes, yeah. Right, across all the nodes, yeah. so w w which means yeah. that every node will have my vote in it. And eventually, because they, they were talking about man-made encryption algorithms uh, using 2021 technology, for example, in 10 years time with quantum computing and all these things, the, those uh, algorithms can be broken and you can see who voted for who. And that breaks the fundamental aspect of anonymous voting for, uh, yeah. for 
the average voter. So there's yeah. issues with blockchain as well. Right? There are, the there are, but that's what, that's what I said, that's arguably uh, a better solution that we have currently now. Uh, yeah. Yes, there are downsides. Yes, uh, you know, issues that you brought up with quantum computing, but I also see the increase in technology. Uh, you know, encryption might also be different after 10 years, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, algorithms are constantly being developed. So I think it goes and hand in hand. So there is always an inherent risk. We cannot just remove the risk altogether. So, uh, I mean, how difficult we can make, I think that's the approach uh, we are taking. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, again, I, I was going back to Kashi by here is that uh, one problem that we face is that the, the sheer logistics of moving EVMs from location to location. Uh, so, uh, and the second part comes in is that when you have uh, those many uh, EVMs or electronic voting machines at different places, it, it would be very difficult to, you know, to run an upgrade on that. Like, let's suppose if we has some sort of, uh, uh, what you can say, security loophole, we have to fix it. So, uh, and, and let's suppose if we have to change the interface, we have to go and update them manually. So how do you how if uh, how do you think we can not that we should or uh, we would go towards that how can we minimize the threat factor and should we keep uh, the decentralized model or should we centralize it and um, update it from the central server how do you uh, go on with, about that uh, my gut instinct right now is to avoid uh automating centralization because the data in transit is the risk right okay, okay um so you can you can have uh, evms in polling stations um which count the vote but count the, the manual vote and then the results are announced publicly right rather than sent and announced centrally so each yeah. district announces like it happened in the yeah. elections uh, recently yeah. each district an announces their result uh, on the media, on TV, uh, everywhere. So there's no dispute that the result has been announced right, and called and recorded. Um, I, I would be I would be very nervous about not announcing the result and sending it electronically uh, and, and having it announced centrally because then you have a central point of failure. Okay. So, um, uh, but you could you could uh, announce the vote and then send the result as well at the same time because then there's no point corrupting it in transit. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's, exactly. Right? So you could, you could do that just to enable uh, uh, news channels and the central government to have it in electronic format tabulated. Okay, and then the second thing that I was talking about, like that, how, how would you uh, deal with the updation of those uh, machines? Like, you know, there would be some uh, elements involved. Let's suppose if we talk about, there would be a device which would be verifying a voter. There would be a dev uh, device which would be casting a voter. And, we would need to update them as well uh, at yeah. time. In terms of firm, firm, firmware updates, firmware, I'm assuming yeah, 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 exactly. you're talking firmware updates. Uh, yes, and, and, and the question is, if vulnerabilities are found in these machines by researchers, uh, who to report to? How is that responsible reporting of vulnerabilities done? Uh, and will everybody report them or somebody will keep them as zero days to exploit in the future? There's, there's all kinds of issues. And then uh, uh, updating them, that, Again, it goes back to people processes and not technology here. Again, the process of managing that, those vulnerabilities and, and updating, uh, patching those vulnerabilities is, is, a, is a people and process thing rather than just a technology thing. And, and that's, again, uh, the same old problem again, right? So yeah, what, sure. what benefit are you... The, the amount of money you'd spend on, on, on these e-voting systems... Uh, is it going to make save money in, in long term? Again, it goes back to which problem you're trying to solve. Are you trying to solve fraud? Or are you trying to save money? Are you trying to make voting more quick and efficient? Because I think in India's use case, it's simply about efficiency and speed, not about fraud or security so much, right? It's more about speed because of this huge population. In Pakistan's case, I think it may be the people are, are wanting it for security and fraud reasons more than efficiency and speed. Uh, so we need to first answer the question, which problem are we trying to solve in the respect? And then that will dictate uh, all the other issues and then the risk appetite as well. So, uh, so what, what I see is, and uh, the main problem that people or we see and they're trying to solve is the fraud aspects. The, the money aspect, it comes later. Uh, yeah, again, so if, 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 the, if the problem you're trying to solve is fraud, I don't think relying on on technology alone is going to help you do that you need, there, there's you may use some technology tools to help 
but really it's more about uh, there needs to be a big cultural change uh, in the country to stop that. Okay. So I think we are past our scheduled time. Uh, I would just like to have a quick, uh, quick question. Uh, and then we would, um, we missed certain lots of other questions as well. That, uh, that, that what I feel is that technologies can only complement the existing process. It should not totally replace the existing process like uh, uh, putting in the physical wood itself. So Ahmed Bhai, should, uh, can we replace it? Uh, or should we replace it? Just yes or no? Or should we go for a hybrid model? Oh, sorry. I don't know what's the case. And uh, I would have to ask you a note, I think. Yeah, so as um, I'm uh, saying, it's mm, very quick. Know, very yes quick. and no. Yes, yes and, and no. no. So we should go for a, for a hybrid model. Hybrid model. Hybrid model. Rehan, uh, I would say no. Uh, we just go right now. We should stick with the paper ballots. Uh, improve our uh, improve our processes. Uh, improve uh, other controls around paper ballots. You know, addressing people issue is quite important in okay. Pakistan. So once you address that, uh, then I think we could move into technology. What we have right now, improve upon that. Okay. Uh, so so. So like uh, not even hybrid, you're saying that we should no. stick with the whatever process we have. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Kashivai, your take on it. Like, um, I, I reserve judgment for now. I'm in between uh, manual and hybrid. Okay? okay. I think hybrid is possible, but it ha should have a lot of conditions. Okay. Uh, and for now, manual, and, and we should, there probably needs to be a wider study done on, on the hybrid module, yeah. uh, hybrid model, should I say. Uh, but for now, I would stick with manual as well. Um, and I would focus more on improving processes and procedures in, yeah. uh, in Pakistan related to elections and many other things as well. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me add on why I mean, the hybrid just in the support of uh, my comment is because sure. the important element is the post-electoral um, you know, assessments. Because the, when the, the counting starts, the manual part, that's actually where the corruption happens because within the polling stations where the counting starts with the manual counting, not only the people part, even the manual counting process brings a lot of inaccuracies and inconsistencies in the results. That's where we need, we need to use the technology uh, from um, you know, the accuracy and uh, you know, um, a better control on the information uh, point of view rather than from a fraud control perspective. That's my yeah. That's I, I, to the, the I actually agree with that. Actually, that you can use technology to actually do the audits afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, optical scanning to make sure to do recounts and things, right? So yeah. actually, there's a, there's another uh, there's a, that's a good idea to actually yeah. have that a manual process. That means you're voting yeah. for hybrid. Thank you. Uh, no, okay. Yeah, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> uh, just uh, I want to encourage everybody. I was at uh, DEF CON in 2017 in Las Vegas, where actually uh, there's a hacking village over there. There's a voting machine hacking village that happened. I was there and I saw with my own eyes how uh, hackers actually were able to open up an EVN machine and get pretty much all the information out of it and hack it. So there was issues with the hardware. They were using Windows CE for, uh, for as an operating system on this, which was accessible via you know, SSH terminal, but, but pretty much no password. The hardware was exposed. You can plug in a USB into it and copy data and manipulate data. So that was a big issue. So if anyone in, is interested, just look up uh, Defcon uh, voting machine hacking village in 2017. I just, I, just, I just read upon it that they were able to play hello on it. That's just yes. that they hacked it, yes. they were able to play yeah. hello on it. Yes. So that's quite yes. interesting. So again, yeah. I don't know which was the culprit. Um, basically, many people would say Windows, but there are many other aspects to it. Uh, oh, no, the <laughs> Windows is one small thing. There are a lot of other issues with the manufacturing of the machine, how it was yeah, set exactly, exactly. and how so, it was so there, There's lots of, uh, I think we're past our scheduled time. I would sure. uh, like to thank all of our uh, panelists. Thank you uh, very much for joining. And uh, um, uh, we, sh we would, uh, we're planning to do a second part of it as well. Uh, so I hope because there are lots of other questions which has been missed, uh, but time was very short, but we'll uh, not keep it going. So 
Thank you very much. And with, and with now, I think I, I would close the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your Thank you thank very much, Thank you very much. And thank uh, you very much. Uh, Shahzad Subhani Sahib and the forum, all the team members who actually made it uh, happen finally. And thank you so much. Uh, uh, you know, it was a privilege meeting Rehan Sahib and Kashif Sahib in this forum. Uh, I wish you the best. And, uh, yeah. you know, we should pray for all together and uh, put our contribution for the betterment of our country. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Jazakum Allah. Take a moment. Yeah. Take a moment. Allah. Salam. Allah.